assembling the bed for the super shelter. My bed will be, the front edge of the bed will be here, the bottom of my feet will be here, my head will rest up there, and the back of the bed will be right here. It's pretty simple, you just kind of custom build it to your shape, your size, or the amount of people that you have. The uh, bumpiness of the ground isn't an issue because we can adjust that as we build the bed up, as you'll see. You also don't have to worry about using green wood. All you need to do is collect wood off the ground. It can be kind of half rotted. It doesn't have to be perfect. So I've basically measured logs and broken them to about my body length. I've made it in a V shape. I don't need a lot of space for my feet down here, but I have wider shoulders, so I've opened up this part of the bed here. So ultimately, this will be where my bed goes. Cross member. Now I can build it as high as I want. Just looking at the lay of this land, the ground slopes upward a bit, so my fire will be higher. The heat from the fire will likely come up on a bit of an angle. So I want to make sure that I get where my body's going to sleep in my bed up nice and high, popped up into the bubble of the super shelter where all the heat is contained. All the cold air will be down at the bottom. So I want to build this up at least chair seat high. So I've got a little ways, <laughs> I've got a little ways to go yet to get it up there. I could have used giant logs or I could use logs this size about wrist thick or about leg thick. It just depends what the local environment has. You can also build this bed uh, and fix it into a movable shelter. You can lash it together strong enough so that as you exhaust the firewood in this area, you can actually pick your bed up and drag it like a travoy to another area where there's more firewood. Rather than going and bringing all the firewood to the shelter, just take the shelter to the firewood. As I build the bed, I'm ensuring that it ends up level. So this backside is, is lower, farther down to the ground. So I've been putting the larger logs on the back, thinner logs on the front, and that's leveling out my actual bed platform. Let's talk about the size of your super shelter and how that corresponds to the size of bed that you make. Here I have two super shelters packaged up. And as you can see, this one, is larger than this one. This particular super shelter is a complete shelter on its own. It's got the mylar, it's got a little bit of tape in there, it's got the, uh, the nylon permeable or breathable fabric, and it's got the plastic covering. And it's fairly small, quite small, that it would fit in the bottom of your backpack. Not too cumbersome to carry. However, I know when I put this together that the area or the size of this particular shelter will not allow for a really high bed. There's not enough fabric. When the shelter is built up like that, imagine a domed shelter here. If you start building your shelter higher and higher and higher, I won't have enough fabric in this one to cover it. So I know ahead of time that this super shelter right here is meant for a low rider or a super shelter that has a maximum bed height of this or even less. Perhaps my bed is right on the ground in spring, summer, or fall. and I don't even have to worry about getting up high. So this would be a low rider survival kit component. It's for a small super shelter. And I've built it even smaller than this, where the size gets down really low with a little tiny fire in the front. And that might do you well uh, in the warmer months of the year. Uh, in the winter months, I tend to go with a bit of a bigger shelter. Uh, if I'm teaching classes, I tend to go with a bigger shelter, something that can be set up with more comfort in mind. Uh, per perhaps for staying for days on end, I'll get a nice high bed in it where I can really get myself up into the air, uh, the warmed air bubble, and so I'll build it a little bigger. You get to customize the size of your super shelter for the purpose of your outing. I'm going to build this super shelter nice and low. I'll need a crossbar right here 
to support the weight of my upper body and my head. I'll need a crossbar right here to support my feet. And I'll need a crossbar in the middle. But usually what I like to do is put it down a little bit lower so that it actually ends up behind my knees. That allows my torso from my head to my butt a nice flexible cushiony mattress. If I put this under my back it tends to you feel it right in your back. Two final rails and we're ready to start building the mattress. One and number two. For the box spring I take the saplings, the flexible saplings, and simply lay them in with the stem or the thicker tip towards the top and the feathery branches towards the bottom. I can choose to trim the bottom hair off here, the fuzz. I'm going to do that. I'll save these and I'll use these for the mattress later. There's one. Oftentimes I'll put about 10 thumb, thumb thick uh, saplings to create the box spring. There we have our saplings nicely placed along there to form the box spring mattress. So these corners are a little bit loose. If you have rope with you, and in this case I have paracord with me, you can certainly lash around the corners to strengthen up your bed. You'll have to do that especially if your bed's going to become portable so that you can actually drag it from one place to another, one location to another. You'll have to lash it securely together. Um, if you don't have rope, you can use the tops of the flexible uh, saplings that we had. In this case I've chosen a crotch here of one branch. You can sometimes lengthen it and extend the uh, ability and make it longer by putting two opposing crotches together like this and that way you've got a longer lashing, longer rope. Okay, So you can tie it with the ropes. It's a bit crude but with practice you can do it uh, you'll find that it's an adequate lashing. Now, in the winter, when it's bitterly cold, they tend to break a lot. In the summer, especially in the spring, they're quite supple and you can bend them with, there's a lot of forgiveness with the amount that you can bend and twist and tie. But in the winter, like it is now with, with cold temperatures, uh, you get a lot of breakage and it becomes kind of a crude tie, but you certainly can make it work. So in this case, I'll just get it worked right underneath the very bottom rail, like that. And then I'm going to pull. For this side I'm going to use a jam knot. The jam knot is the subject of another video. That side is nice and tight now. To be efficient I gathered them all precisely the same way. I left all the broken sharp tips or stems on this end and all the feathery soft end pieces on the other end. It's just a uh, the more time you spend in the woods, you find these little efficiencies that make things smoother. All good beds have a pillow, so I often like to build a little bit of a pillow up right off the bat. Now, alternatively, uh, what you could do is, instead of making your pillow out of green boughs, you could make it out of dead boughs. And I'll just reach up here, and you can see what I mean. Like this. I've only grabbed a few of them, but in some of the other videos, the twig bundle fire lighting method is uh, done by gathering a bunch of dry twig branches like that. You can make your pillow out of that. I could get this to be three or four times bigger and use that as my pillow. 
Then if your fire happens to go out, it's very quick to just pull out your pillow and throw it on the fire or, or light it up again and start your fire. So that's another way that you can go ahead with it. Now I'm going to arrange my mattress. So I'll take these boughs. I don't want those sharp pointy edges right there sticking into my back. So I'll put them on the side on an angle and I'll leave the light feathery branches in the middle where my body's mostly going to be. Makes for a comfortable mattress. And just start placing them in what we would call a herringbone fashion. Just like that. Good. That's looking good. And you can afford to be picky if you want. It's your comfort we're talking about here. So you might as well make it nice. If you're too hasty then you end up having to adjust it later down the road. There we go. And I'll just carry on under the torso of the body, which is this section. I like to put it at least four thing fingers thick and get a good thick mattress. As you work your way down to your feet, your legs weigh a lot less and you don't actually need that much under you, but up here it's nice to have a good lot of padding. Yeah, that's looking good. I'll cover the whole bed, top to bottom to start once with one bundle. And then I'll use the second bundle to fine tune the whole arrangement. So here I'm going to put less as we get to the feet. I'm less concerned about a thickness of branches at my feet. And as I mentioned before, you can do this with grass. I've done it with grass. I've done it with cattails numerous times. If you're beside a lake ecology, you have such an amazing amount of cattails available to you. You can make all kinds of beds. Incidentally, another way to carry large bundles like this, sometimes I'll go out and I'll gather a bundle twice this size and it gets to be cumbersome in, as far as wrapping your hands around it. Well, it's fairly easy to take a stick like this, shove the stick underneath, grab that end as it comes through, and then do a big squeeze. And you can carry bundles twice the size of what I have right here just by using that stick on the bottom. Oh, two bundles was plenty for this size of bed. This is the way the branch grew on the tree. And all the needles are kind of pointing upward as if they're reaching to the sun. So the sun up there. If you look on the underside, it's got like a bony spine that runs down the backside with less needles. Well, you wouldn't want to put that in your back, so you always make sure that it's upright with the softer needles as your mattress. I've got a little bit of loose ends here. And what I mean by that is this log right here is sticking out past what I consider to be the end of my bed. Now I want my plastic shelter or my skin to be nice and close, not out here. I'd like it to be right about here. So I need to get, remove this and now if I had a saw it would be a simple matter of cutting it off. But I don't have a saw with me. I'm building this shelter without a saw. So I'm going to just use my knife, a baton right here and my knife and I'm just going to go ahead take enough of the wood out of the way so that I can get it to a point where I can break it. Now I can work on these bows. Now I don't want to push them back through because then it makes the other end stick out. So instead any of them that are really long, I'll just bust it off or use my knife and cut them off so they're closer. So to prepare these saplings or whiteys, uh, sometimes you keep the branches on, sometimes you take the branches off. Uh, it gets to be pretty fuzzy if you leave them on. And just to illustrate a method to do that, usually you pull or give a yank on the branches 
in the direction of the, the thick end or the stem. So I'll put the tip up there and the stem down here and you give it a little bit of a yank and the branches should come off fairly nice and cleanly. The nice thing is if you don't have a glove this can be kind of hard on your bare skin but you can keep holding on to the twigs and as you pile up twigs in your hand it starts to pad your skin almost as if you had a glove. So rather than discarding that and throwing it out I'll hold it there and use it as padding for the rest of the branches that I'm tugging like that. So I'm effectively building myself a padded glove using the branches. And in this fashion you can quickly go down a tree and remove the branches. In some cases like this, I'll leave this more robust branch because I can use that to help tie the whitey for the shelter later on. So we'll stick one back in here and you can drive it into the ground or you can just weave it into in between the logs as I've done. There. And now I just bring them close together. Now, this particular shelter, I want to get it down nice and low. I want this to be a low rider. I want this to just clear my head. So I'm actually going to suck, suck it down even just a little bit more. Kind of right like so. And that's where I'm going to weave. I happen to have a split branch on this one so I can wrap one around one direction. I can wrap the other branch in the other direction. So that. Now this one I'm going to take in the other direction. Wrap it this way. As I get to these branches, I like to twist them. Allows better grab and grip. Twist around. Look for a place where I can tuck it. Finish it. Now I'll break this one around. Alright, so I'm pretty happy with that. It's a nice low rider in this case. Now I like to get a bit of a lean on this forward facing one so that the plastic window falls out here rather than right against. So it falls out here a bit. So I'm going to just work a little lean into it. The more vertical that you keep the plastic window, the better it is at shedding sparks that fly from the fire, hit the plastic window, they'll drop. If it's leaned back, they have a tendency to stick long enough to burn a hole through. This can be lower because it's the back of the shelter, so I'm going to bring it right down. Like I say, I'm making a low rider here, so I'm going to go down nice and low and carry on the weaving. If this is a survival shelter, I'm stuck out here for the night, I want to be comfortable. I don't want to have to gather a huge amount of firewood to heat a big shelter. I want to keep a small shelter so that I can minimize the amount of firewood collecting I have to do and keep a low fire. Now I'm going to put one from the back. Like so. This one. Bring it over the top. Go to the back. Like so. In the summer you can push this right into the ground. In the winter you can push it into hardened snow. Or if you have a bed you can use the bed. Captured it in between. Good. And now I'll pull it back, stick it in there. <clears throat> Start to warm up. Alright, so our 
first step now that our framework is all done is to just get the, uh, the mylar sheet on. So this is one mylar sheet. And you have to be very delicate with this. It can be tricky in a wind, of course, because this stuff, once it gets a tear, it, it uh, rips quite easily. I'm going to use a couple techniques. One is to just separate some of the saplings and pinch the fabric in between. That's one technique. And then another technique is to use our handy dandy little uh, clothes pins that we've created because then you can Temporarily clip it and maneuver stuff around. I'll just do another one on this side. This side I can tuck fairly easily. Close pin on there. And there's one close pin there. The main thing we're looking for with the reflective ceiling is that it's somewhat perpendicular to the fire so the heat from the fire comes up, hits the mylar fabric and bounces into the back of the bed. So it's a reflective ceiling, not necessarily a back. And again, it would be ideal to have it on the right angle from the fire. So if my finger is going up at a right angle. It then bounces, hits the mylar, and reflects to the back side and the lower reaches of your shelter, keeping your back warm. Then the next piece is to put our, our uh, breathable or porous fabric over top. So one uh, type of fabric that a lot of people will use is they'll go to surplus stores and buy parachutes and cut sections of parachutes or even rip parachutes and they'll buy those parachutes. The parachute fabric is beautiful. It's breathable, which means you can blow and breathe, suck and blow through it uh, very easily. And this provides fresh air exchange for the shelter, the super shelter system. Uh, in this case, I've just got a really thin, lightweight bed sheet, which works well too. And we'll just go ahead and throw it on. Now you don't want to cover the front, that's where our polyethylene window goes. You just cover the entire shelter framework as low down on this side as possible and as low down on this side as, as possible. And that should do. So here I'm going to just separate and pinch. And that's held in place. And here I'm going to pinch as well. To hold that in place. I'll take off this little clothespin that I had here and reposition it. Just like that. Same thing all the way around. Another clothespin here to take off. So as you can see, I've got a lot of fabric out the back, so I can change this a little bit. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually turn it uh, about 45 degrees and put it kind of uh, crossways to the shelter so that I end up going from one pointed corner straight across to another pointed corner over top of the ridge line. I'm just going to twist it and make it fit so I get the maximum amount of coverage possible.
So it's covered down to the bottom very nicely. And for this little bit of extra, I'm just going to look for a, a log. There happens to be one right here. And roll this up in the log. Keep it down snug. There we go. Good. So this provides our fresh air exchange in and out of the shelter. The next stage will be to put the plastic over top, the plastic covering, which creates a waterproof cover, which keeps off the, the rain, keeps out the wind, keeps out the smoke, and uh, most importantly, it creates our impermeable bubble on the shelter. Now the plastic will come down, but not all the way down, because that would seal off our fresh air exchange. And you'll see once we put the plastic on, I'll keep the plastic up high, and allow this nice open section here for fresh air exchange in and out of the shelter. We want the polyethylene or plastic window to come right down to the front. This will be our starting place. We'll bring it right over and we'll roll up the front in this log. Because we have a fire going to keep our hands warm and, and that sort of thing, uh, we have to take care that the plastic of course doesn't blow into the fire. Uh, sometimes the shelter is built, the fire isn't going yet, and it, it's not a problem. Now that I've got it gathered at the back. You can see here I've got a gap now underneath and this gap carries around onto that side and that's our fresh air exchange area which brings fresh air in and out of the shelter. So we'll leave that up nice and high like that. I've gone ahead and tied some paracord to this sapling that's here and I'm going to secure the plastic to it. and tie that further back to any type of anchor that you can find. Be it trees or be it an anchor in the snow. We're seeing the, the objective here, which is an area of fresh air exchange out behind. And of course the, the trick being that that fabric underneath there needs to be porous or breathable. It keeps the insects out and it allows for your uh, fresh air exchange and it must be down low. That will maintain a bubble of warmed air inside the shelter. A few closing remarks. This is the classic super shelter design that was developed by Morris Kohansky. Check out my video on the history of the Morris Kohansky super shelter for some inspiring background information. This style of super shelter requires a mix of natural materials, synthetic materials, some practice, some experience, and time to master to get to a place where you can easily and quickly build this shelter anywhere at any time. It's really worth it. In my bushcraft and outdoor education career, I have yet to discover a more versatile and effective, quickly constructed shelter. Try one out through a cold winter night, and I guarantee you too will be completely convinced. Take care, and don't forget to subscribe and share our videos. Thanks for watching. Okay, so I'm past halfway. Now the knife goes away. Now here, with pressure, I'm just trying to make a crack down the back side of that V-notch. So, like that. Now if you're too quick, too fast, you'll end up just breaking it. Oh, that one snapped on me and it went a little quick. But basically that's the idea with the clothespin. And so if we have a little upright piece like that, you just clamp it on just like that. Open.